Good morning, everyone. My name's Sally, and I'm a member of the Carlton 10 a.m. congregation. Our Bible reading today comes from the book of 1 Thessalonians, chapter 2, verse 17, to chapter 3, verse 13. But, brothers and sisters, when we were orphaned by being separated from you for a short time, in person, not in thought, out of our intense longing, we made every effort to see you. For we wanted to come to you, certainly I, Paul, did, again and again, but Satan blocked our way. For what is our hope, our joy, or the crown in which we will glory in the presence of our Lord Jesus when he comes? Is it not you? Indeed, you are our glory and joy. So when we could stand it no longer, we thought it best to be, to be left by ourselves in Athens. We sent Timothy, who is our brother and co-worker in God's service in spreading the gospel of Christ, to strengthen and encourage you in your faith, so that no one would be unsettled by these trials. For you know quite well that we are destined for them. In fact, when we were with you, we kept telling you that we would be persecuted, and it turned out that way, as you well know. For this reason, when I could stand it no longer, I sent to find out about your faith. I was afraid that in some way the tempter had tempted you, and that our labours might have been in vain. But Timothy has just now come to us from you and has brought good news about your faith and love. He has told us that you always have pleasant memories of us and that you long to see us, just as we also long to see you. Therefore, brothers and sisters, in all our distress and persecution, we were encouraged about you because of your faith. For now we really live since you are standing firm in the Lord. How can we thank God enough for you in return for all the joy we have in the presence of our God because of you? Night and day we pray most earnestly that we may see you again and supply what is lacking in your faith. Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus clear the way for us to come to you. May the Lord make your love increase and overflow for each other and for everyone else, just as ours does for you. May he strengthen your hearts so that you will be blameless and holy in the presence of our God and Father when our Lord Jesus comes with all his holy ones. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks, Sally. Our oh, friends, uh, good morning. Uh, it's great to be with you this morning as we listen uh, to God's word together. So uh, let's pray. Heavenly Father, feed us with your word so that we might be strengthened and encouraged in Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. Well, friends, uh, new restrictions are in place uh, for many of us uh, this week. Uh, many of us live in the suburbs that have been locked down again. Uh, and if that's you, uh, please know that we're praying for you. Uh, we want to support you. Uh, please reach out if there's uh, any way that we can help. The prospect of another month of separation from family and friends, from brothers and sisters at church, uh, is a challenging one, and we want to be alongside you in this. Uh, we want to be alongside you because separation from loved ones has been one of the most challenging parts of this pandemic for most Australians. Uh, we're thankful that we haven't had far worse circumstances like so many other parts of the world, uh, but still the separation that we've experienced and continue to experience uh, is a heavy and real burden. 
uh, whether it's not seeing elderly parents or grandparents, uh, not seeing new babies, grandkids, nephews, nieces, uh, perhaps we're missing our school friends uh, or missing not seeing our work colleagues in the flesh. And for many of us, I've heard you mention the sadness of not being able to meet together with our brothers and sisters in Christ on Sunday at church. Uh, Now, I know some of you are sitting there now thinking, well, church on the couch in pyjamas isn't all bad. Uh, But still, the grief and the sadness of separation is real and heavy. Even when we know that we're doing the right thing by staying home and avoiding other people. Even when we know that we're serving others uh, by saving lives, as the Prime Minister put it this week, uh, the effect on our mental health and our well-being can be real, and the effect on our spiritual health can be significant as well. We're, We're social creatures. We're designed for relationships with other people. That's how God made us, and that's how he sustains our mental and spiritual health. So an extended absence like this, even with phone calls and video calls, uh, it can still take a real toll on us. Like so many of our experiences this year, our separation from each other feels unprecedented. It's a completely new experience for most of us. Who could have thought back at the start of the year that we'd have become so familiar with words like self-isolate, quarantine, physical distancing, But when we dig a little deeper, we see that this is not so unprecedented. This is certainly not the first widespread disease to affect humanity. There have been many. In fact, we're not even the first Christians who've had to deal with separation and the anxiety and sadness that comes with it. We're not the first Christians to be separated from people we care deeply about. We're not the first to be worried about the spiritual health of our brothers and sisters when we can't be with them in person and encourage each other. This is not the first time that God's people have faced trials and sufferings and had to persevere in faith in the midst of uncertainty and absence. One of the many blessings of reading the Bible is that it helps us to have a longer memory We get to see how our spiritual ancestors have dealt with challenges like this before and how God has been faithful and cared for them through it all. Today's passage has a lot of resonance with our present circumstances, especially for those in suburbs currently in lockdown. Paul, Silas and Timothy are writing to the Christians in Thessalonica and they say in verse 17 that they were separated for a short time, in person, not in thought, And so out of their intense longing, they made every effort to see the Thessalonians. They wanted to go and see them, but they couldn't. Now remember, Paul and his ministry colleagues, Silas and Timothy, had travelled to Thessalonica and preached the gospel there. They'd preached the life-changing good news that Jesus died and rose again for the forgiveness of sins, that he is the saviour of all who trust in him and the Lord of all creation. And as they did so, some Thessalonians believed the gospel. They put their faith in Jesus and a young church grew up. But Acts 17 also tells us uh, that they only had three weeks to preach in the synagogue there before a violent riot was stirred up and they had to leave during the night, moving on to Berea and then to Athens. And so now Paul and his missionary band are pretty nervous about how this young church is going. Three weeks isn't long. It's not very long to disciple new Christians and teach them how to follow Jesus. But in God's sovereignty, it was long enough for them to come to faith, for them to pick up the basics, and for strong bonds of friendship and mutual affection to be built, both within this new church community and between these new converts and the missionaries who had brought them the gospel. In fact, the bond of friendship between them is so strong that the missionaries writing this letter can talk about their intense longing to see them. They had a a deep longing, a great desire to see them. Now, we just need to unpack this this word longing or, or desire here. Often we associate desire with our sexuality, especially our sinful sexual desires. And the Bible does often talk about desire as a negative thing. We're warned against following desires for sin or cultivating or encouraging those desires. But here we see a different kind of desire. 
Like our sexuality, it's still a strong, deep desire to connect with other people. But this desire is pulling in a good and godly direction. There are some desires that Jesus encourages us to grow and pursue. Because desire and affection, it's not just for romantic relationships. It's also for friendship, as we see here in this relationship between absent friends. Now, I have to admit, we feel a bit awkward and uncomfortable about desire and affection language in friendship. As a teenager, I was part of a fairly large youth group, uh, lots of teenage boys and girls, uh, and as you can imagine, uh, there was a lot of interest in who was getting together with who. We saw Nick and Sally talking together. We saw them sit next to each other. Ooh, mate, are they going out? Ooh. And then the classic response from Nick or from Sally, no, no, we're just friends. Just friends. It says a lot, that response. It's not just teenagers who use it. Just friends. As though friendship is a lesser category of relationship or a lesser bond between two people or involves less mutual care and concern. And perhaps our social media platforms have cheapened friendship because if I can call hundreds, if not thousands of people my friends just with a single click, well, it can't mean that much, can it? But we must be wary of taking our friendships too lightly because the friendships we develop with other Christians, they're not a trivial thing at all. I didn't end up marrying anyone from that youth group, but I did make some of my strongest and longest Christian friends with those people. Christian friends are deep and significant relationships. Look at verse 17 again. The missionaries call their friends brothers and sisters. They're family. This is not just friends. But more than that, they say, when we were orphaned by being separated from you for a short time, they were orphaned. A short separation was like losing their parents, losing their children. And that's the big issue in this section of the letter. Paul and the missionaries are separated from the Thessalonians. They're longing to see their dear friends, but they can't. We're not exactly sure why. It probably wasn't because they were living in a hot spot of a global disease, but you never know. Something has happened to prevent them travelling and seeing each other. But the missionaries love their friends. They really care about them, and so they're anxious for them. They're desperate to hear how they're going. This is a deep and committed friendship. It's so strong that it's more like a family relationship. And that's what we are as God's people. We're members of his family. We're brother and sister to each other. We're not just friends. And so we're to love each other, not just as acquaintances or Facebook friends, but as family. That's what we should be aiming at in our relationship with our friends at church. But how will we do this? How will we cultivate and grow our friendships and and develop our mutual affection for one another while we wait for Jesus' return? The friendship in this passage shows us uh, three important facets of Christian friendship, three aspects of friendship while we wait for Jesus' return. Uh, We see that Christian friendships are based on mutual faith. They grow with mutual encouragement And they aim together for holiness in God's sight. So based on mutual faith, grow with mutual encouragement, aiming for holiness together in God's sight. Uh, So firstly, friendship based on mutual faith. Most friendships rely on some sort of commonality, uh, some shared interest to get going. Most of my friends I've met because we were in the same place at the same time. Uh, We went to school together or university. We shared an interest in cricket or soccer and played in the same team. Uh, Friendships normally need some sort of catalyst uh, to bring people together and get them started. And for Christian friendships, uh, there's a deep commonality that brings us together, a much deeper foundation even than these shared interests. It's not just that we go to the same church or we see each other uh, on Sunday It's not that we have the same moral or political or cultural values, not even the same taste in music or aesthetics. The basis for Christian friendship is our shared faith in Christ. 
It's our deep trust and dependence on Jesus. The foundation of our lives is shared. The one spirit lives in each of us. And so we're united at a deep level. That's why we're friends. This means that what makes us friends uh, isn't which church or congregation we're part of. There's only one church. It belongs to Christ. It's not our the- theological or political stances. We each share the one spirit. We're saved by the same gospel. We can disagree on these other things. That's, that's fine. Friends are allowed to disagree. But we must do so as friends. Friends who share mutual affection and concern for one another. We can't exclude people from friendship because they're not like us in some way. Because actually in Christ, we share the same foundation. The basis of Christian friendships is our shared faith in Christ. That's what unites us. Now have a look at verse 5 where Paul says, When I could stand it no longer, that is being separated, when I could stand it no longer, I sent to find out about your faith. I was afraid that in some way the tempter had tempted you and that our labours might have been in vain. Paul's deep concern is about their faith. Because he knows that if they give up on their faith, the basis of their relationship with him will be gone. His real concern for his friends is not so much that they might be suffering, which he knows that they are, but that they might be led away from Christ in the midst of their suffering. Because they share the same faith, their relationship is deeper If anything, he's more anxious for them, more concerned for them. His longing for them is more intense because of their shared faith in Christ. So how does Paul express his concern when he can't go to see them? How can we grow Christian friendships when we're absent from each other in person? Well, Christian friendships grow through mutual encouragement. We see that in verse 2. We sent Timothy, who is our brother and co-worker in God's service in spreading the gospel of Christ, to strengthen and encourage you in the faith, so that no one would be unsettled through these trials. So the missionary sent Timothy back to Thessalonica uh, to find out how their faith is going and to encourage them. They're not checking to see if they're suffering. They seem to know that they are. In fact, part of Paul's initial teaching was that trials would definitely be part of the Christian life. We're destined for them. We follow a suffering king who took up his cross, and so we too take up our crosses and follow in his footsteps. But in the midst of suffering and trials... Christian friends can provide great encouragement. They can help us to persevere. And that's what Timothy is sent to do here. Paul seems pretty anxious as he waits for Timothy's return. What if the church has been scattered by this persecution? What if they've given up the faith and the Christian community has disbanded? What if all his work has been in vain? How will Paul persevere in the face of that kind of discouragement. But we see that the encouragement between Christians is not just one way, it's two way. It's not just Paul and Timothy encouraging the Thessalonians. Because look at verse 6, there's good news. Timothy has just now come to us from you and has brought good news about your faith and love. He's told us that you always have pleasant memories of us and that you long to see us, just as we also long to see you. Therefore, brothers and sisters, in all our distress and persecution, we were encouraged about you because of your faith. Timothy has brought back great news. He's brought back a wonderful report. The Thessalonians are strong in their faith. They're full of love, and they remember Paul and the missionary team with great fondness and affection. They are persevering in their hope. And this greatly encourages Paul and the missionary team, even in the midst of their distress. In fact, they go further in verse 8. 
For now we really live since you are standing firm in the Lord. How can we thank God enough for you in return for all the joy we have in the presence of our God because of you? Paul and Silas and Timothy are overjoyed. They're overwhelmed with thankfulness to God for all the joy they have before God because of the faith and love and hope of this young Christian community. So not only does Paul encourage the Thessalonians, but they encourage him. It's reciprocal. Christian friendship grows through encouragement, and that encouragement is a two-way street. We all need the encouragement of Christian friends, especially at this time, to keep us growing in our faith and hope and love. And we all need to be encouraging our Christian friends, encouraging them in their faith and hope and love. We do lots of this through our home groups here at St Jude's, but perhaps you could find other ways to do this. A letter or a kind message, a gift of some kind, a word of encouragement to help someone persevere in trusting Jesus in the midst of the trials they're facing. We want our church community to be like a web, a thick network of mutually encouraging relationships where everyone gives encouragement and everyone receives encouragement with no one left out. Because Christian friendships of deep affection, uh, they're based on shared faith and they grow through mutual encouragement. But what are they growing towards? What's the vision for Christian friendship? We see that goal in the final few verses. Look at what Paul prays for his friends because this actually shows us what their friendship is growing towards. Verse 11 says... Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus clear the way for us to come to you. Okay, first thing here, being together. As a member of our church put it to me this week, even though online church is hard, it's good that we're missing church and missing being together because it shows just how much we value gathering together, how significant our community is. Christian friendships are oriented towards unity and gathering together. That's why it feels so unnatural to be separated like this. Uh, But there's more in verse 12. May the Lord make your love increase and overflow for each other and for everyone else, just as ours does for you. Christian friendship is about growing in love, and not just love within the family. The love in Christian friendship should overflow beyond our community. It's not enough for us to just love our own. God wants us to love our neighbours, to love our world as well. Christian friendships are designed to help us grow as loving people. Uh, So we're growing towards being together, we're growing in love, but there's a bigger picture again. The ultimate goal of friendship while we wait. In verse 13, may he strengthen your hearts so that you will be blameless and holy in the presence of our God and Father when our Lord Jesus comes with all his holy ones. So that you will be blameless and holy in the presence of God. Imagine that, to be perfectly acceptable to him. Nothing to hide. Nothing to be ashamed about. To be so like Jesus in who you are that you are holy and blameless before him. To know that God loves you all the way through. Friends, that's exactly what Jesus has done for us. In his death on the cross, he washes us clean of all our unholiness. We are spotless before God because of Jesus. And that's what's going to be revealed when Jesus returns. So that's the goal of Christian friendship, to help each other, to endure through the hardships, to to persevere in our faith for that day of glory and joy. And to help each other to grow uh, more like who we really are, holy and blameless in God's sight. And won't it be a joy to see our friends on that day, to see one another holy and blameless in God's sight, 
after we've made it through all the separation, all the challenges and trials and anxieties, and we're finally gathered together in God's presence and we see each other for what we are, holy and blameless in his sight. For Paul and his team, their Thessalonian friends are their hope, their joy, their crown. They will glory in what God has done in the Thessalonians on that day when Jesus returns. And so for us, I'm so excited to see you, my Christian friends, my brothers and sisters, to see you holy and blameless in Jesus' presence. That's how great hope our great joy. So let's pray together that God would help us to encourage one another to persevere for that day. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the death and resurrection of the Lord Jesus that makes us holy and blameless in your sight and gathers us together as your people. Thank you that it gives us a firm uh, basis for our friendships. Would you help us to encourage and support one another, particularly in these present trials and challenges, Lord, uh, but also in those to come in the future. Help us to stick together, to encourage and support each other through these obstacles. Because, Lord, we long for that day. We can't wait to see each other when Jesus returns, to see how you've made each of us are so beautiful and holy and spotless in your sight, Lord. Help us to long all the more for that day, even as we support and encourage each other. In Jesus' name, amen.